At the beginning of the chapter, we pointed out that our knowledge about electric fields and magnetic fields was incomplete and would not allow us to fully describe and explain what we would observe in the case of certain experiments. And we said back then that we needed more theory, or at least one more equation, in order to complement the knowledge that we have about electric fields and magnetic fields. And so what we're going to do now is introduce two laws, Lenz's law and Faraday's law. Now it turns out that Lenz's law is not associated with an equation. It's just a statement that gives us the direction of the induced current I induced. And it tells us that the induced current I induced flows in a direction that causes it to create an induced magnetic field B induced to oppose the change in the original magnetic flux. And once again, what matters is the change in magnetic flux. That means that we have to be able to determine if the magnetic flux in the given problem stays the same, increases, or decreases. So let's look at a simple example to illustrate this statement. It's a bit of a strange statement the first time you hear it. So we have a magnet here that's approaching a conducting ring. And of course, magnets create magnetic fields, and magnetic field lines are closed. So they're going to bend away like this, because eventually they have to come back around through the south pole of this magnet. And that means that some of these magnetic field lines don't go through the conducting ring, whereas these do. However, by approaching the magnet, eventually these magnetic field lines will go through the conducting ring. Pretty easy to see. Let's just move the magnet closer. And we see right away that all of the magnetic field lines now go through the conducting ring. So first things first, we have magnetic flux from the get-go, and the magnetic flux points from left to right. So I usually use a double arrow to indicate magnetic flux. That's actually a personal preference. It's not an official notation. But I would write something like this, just to keep track. And how do I know it's from left to right? Well, the field lines in question that create this magnetic flux are oriented from left to right. So I have magnetic flux off the bat. But I don't care about the value of magnetic flux at a given moment. I care to know whether it stays constant, increases, or decreases. In this particular case, it's easy to convince ourselves that it increases, because as the magnet moves closer, there are more field lines that go through the conducting ring. Therefore, the magnetic flux through the conducting ring increases. So I would write something like that. Increases, or increasing, in parentheses. So it tells me that I have a magnetic flux to the right originally, and I know that it's increasing. By Lenz's law, the induced current will create B induced to oppose the increase in magnetic flux here. Well, the only way that you oppose the increase in magnetic flux is if B induced points the other way. In other words, you have to create flux from right to left to oppose the increase in the flux here. And the only way that you get B induced pointing to the left is if your induced current, I induced, by the right hand rule, goes around the conducting ring like this. So fair enough, that's Lenz's law. One thing to point out, the way I went about this is to first figure out the flux how it changes. Then I derived the direction of B induced. And at the end, I got the direction of I induced. However, that's me reverse engineering it to get it all right. In practice, I induced comes first because I induced creates B induced. So it's not that B induced creates I induced. It's not that at all. It's just that it's easier to go backwards to get the direction of B induced and I induced back. But really what's happening is that, as we'll see in Faraday's law, you're creating an EMF around the ring immediately. That EMF is going to drive I induced, which creates B induced. So that's just to be clear as to what happens in what sequence of, you know, in terms of the physical quantities that we're dealing with. But in order to find the direction of I induced, it's actually easier to do it the way I did it. First, determine 
what the direction of B induced has to be and then reverse engineer it to figure out the direction of I induced. So let's do it with a magnet that's moving away from the loop now, just to see how we would do it with a slightly different scenario. Now, same magnet, same kind of magnetic field, and we actually have flux originally, again from left to right, because the field lines that do go through the conducting loop go from left to right. However, by moving the magnet away, you are going to get fewer and fewer field lines going through the conducting ring. And that's because eventually, these field lines that used to go through the conducting ring bend away too quickly and end up not going through the ring anymore once you move the magnet away. So we still have magnetic flux to the right, but it's decreasing in this case. And so this is the perfect illustration of why you care about whether the flux increases, decreases, or stays the same. You do not care about the direction of flux all by itself at any given moment. You care about how the flux changes. Okay, so now phi b is decreasing to the right. Well, b induced must oppose the change in flux. And in this case, b induced is going to have to come to the rescue and point to the right to try to maintain the flux to the right that is decreasing. And the only way that I get B induced to point to the right is if I induced flows around the conducting ring like this by the right hand rule. Now again, I induced creates B induced. It was easier for me, however, to first draw B induced and then determine from that the direction of I induced. It's just easier in practice to get all the directions to match up. But fundamentally, what's happening is that you get an induced current that creates B induced. And the role of B induced is to oppose the change in the magnetic flux. Thanks for watching this video. At Congress Academy, we create custom study guides so that you don't have to. Send us your syllabus and some old exams, and we'll put together lecture notes, practice problems with step by step solutions, and classic exam questions so that you don't waste your time. All you have to do is log in and focus on studying what matters most. And if you have questions, we're available to help. If you'd like to learn more about how Congress Academy can help you do well, check us out at congressacademy.com. We look forward to helping you. See you there.